And that brings us to number 14. Don't California my Texas. That's a very common saying around here. And it's not that we're not welcoming and we don't want people to move here, but we just don't understand why are you leaving these areas in particularly California, the West Coast, the Northeast, where you have higher restrictions, higher taxations, not as much of a business friendly environment. And then come to Texas where we are a lot more freedom friendly, a lot more business friendly. You know, taxes are a lot less and yet vote for the same type of policy that typically enact these types of things that become more restrictive. That's what we just don't understand. We want people to move into the state and continually build our community and our economy, but we don't want it at the expense of where all of that's going to go away. And so we find this all the time on our channel. People will comment that, and it may seem a little abrupt or rude the way it comes off, but again, that's online, right? That's comments, it's YouTube. So the context behind that is, is that we want you to move here. We welcome new people. That's what Texas was built on. However, don't wreck it, right? Don't wreck Texas. That's what we're asking. And if you do want to move here from those areas and vote for those same type of policies and politics and people, then move to Austin, please. All right. Leave us alone in Dallas, San Antonio and Houston. But that's the thing about politics here in Texas. We weigh on the red side. We weigh on the conservative side. That's it. We're traditionalists. There's nothing wrong with that. We believe that you should be able to do whatever it is you want to do. We just don't want your beliefs imposed on us and we don't want to impose our beliefs on you. Now, the legislation may pass certain laws and things like that that you don't agree with, but then that's why you have 49 other options to pick and choose from because people do have an overall tendency of belief of like right to life and, you know, protecting the unborn, those types of scenarios. And so that is something that we believe in here. We believe in life. We believe in children and children in the womb. And it's okay if you don't believe those things, but what we're saying is like, like, hey, don't come over here and start voting to try to get all of that taken out because you want to take advantage of the taxes and the more freedom and all these other things. But then you want to, you know, impose those types of beliefs, which are not as traditional as people that live in Texas believe in. And so why would people want to come here and put up that fight anyways? You know, that's what we just don't understand. Now, are those things going to change over time? Likely, it looks like with the way our country is headed and those types of decisions are moving in the direction where it's going to be a free for all before you know it. But I would say Texas is one of the last places where if you are a little bit more traditional, you are a little bit more conservative and you want to live your life and be left alone and you do accept others no matter what they believe, which I believe that's the way most Texans are. And is there a few outlier cases? Of course there is. There's going to be in any type of state or scenario or situation. We can't control that. But the overall arching theme of Texas is community. It's traditional values. It's standards. It's work hard, provide for your family and leave your neighbor alone, but also help your neighbor if they ever need anything. And that I do believe is really great about Texas is that we will do anything for anybody, regardless of what you believe. And it just seems now more and more that our country is becoming a lot more divided and people are not even willing to have those conversations. But hey, you know, if you do think certain ways and you want to go against those traditional values that are here in Texas, like I said, move to Austin, but also, I mean, Dallas, Houston, in the metro areas, you're going to find those are going to lean more to the blue side in the city and the urban areas. And then as you start to expand outwards, you get towards the suburbs and the country, you're going to find a lot more traditionalists, a lot more conservatives and leaning much further to the red side. And number 13 is weather. Now, let me just warn you, you probably know this already, but the weather can be extreme here in Texas. It is terrible. It is like one way or the other. There's a little bit of in between whenever it comes to fall and spring. But right now we're seeing record heat. We're over 100 degrees in the middle of summer every single day, reaching up to 105, 106 some days. Now, Dallas is not as humid as Houston, Austin, and San Antonio. So there's a little bit of a relief there, but it's not that much. But otherwise, if you don't like really hot summers, it's going to be pretty difficult for you to get through that. Or you're going to need a pool or have a community pool that you can escape to or stay inside in the AC all day. Now, on top of that, you have frequent 
frequent hailstorms in the spring. And if you're not familiar with hailstorms, it's bizarre because it just happens out of nowhere. Now they're pretty good at being able to warn you about this. So if you have your vehicles parked outside, this is a great time to bring them inside in the garage if you have one. If you don't have one, if you live down in the city where a lot of these city neighborhoods or areas don't have garages, especially on the older homes, you are in for some trouble there because there is a lot of insurance claims happening because of damaged cars with hell every single year. We actually just went through it ourselves. Travis had his truck parked outside, even though he's got a perfectly good garage, but for some reason he just likes to park on the street. And of course a hell storm came through, completely damaged the truck, and then we got to make an insurance claim. And Travis is already prone to uh, accidents. This guy gets in an accident like every month, it seems like every other month. Something's always happening. Now it's usually not his fault. He just attracts the really bad drivers that just randomly run into him. But still, if you have the opportunity and you know the hell storm is coming or you get warning, take it inside because if you haven't been through a hell storm, it is something else. You definitely don't want to be inside. So don't go running or for a walk or hanging out in the neighborhood if that's also coming through. I mean, they could take you out. You can get anywhere from pebble up to golf ball or softball size hell. Now I haven't seen softball size. Probably the biggest hell I've ever seen is golf ball size, but that can break windows. It can damage shingles. And so that's another issue with homeowners insurance here in the North Texas area is roofs. And then to add on top of all of that is tornadoes. Now, every single area has its issues with weather, right? Houston is dealing with hurricanes. Florida is always dealing with hurricanes. The West Coast seems to be dealing with a lot of wildfires. But some people will say is better about those issues is that they're predictable as where tornadoes, you can get a tornado warning, but that tornado can come down and touch down very quickly. And that is something that we don't take lightly. But I will say I've been in Dallas for 20 plus years. I've never been affected by a tornado. I have heard tornado sirens many, many times, but you know, we have different precautions we can take. So they do have sirens if one comes into the area. In my time here in Dallas, I've probably known of three that have come through the center of Dallas. They have done some damage, but as far as I remember, there hasn't been really any casualties for that because a lot of people here are prepared. They know what to do. And whether that's getting underneath a stairwell and door frames or in the bathtub with mattresses over the top, or some people have tornado safe rooms built into their house as well, which is not a bad option, especially if you're doing new construction. But I will say that it's not that big of a deal in my opinion. I've been here again, over 20 plus years, never had an issue, never been so concerned about it. I had to get out. We're also at the bottom edge of what's called tornado alley. So you will see there's a lot worse tornadoes that happen in Oklahoma and Kansas and you know those areas kind of like in the central plains there. So Dallas at least is on the tail end of tornado alley. You don't get them that frequently here. You will get a few warnings. Usually every spring is when they tend to happen and they do have sirens to warn you in case you want to take cover. But again, I've never had an issue. So it's something that is not really high on my concern list. Now, the other side of that is that during the summer months, sometimes it does not rain at all. So we tend to get into these drought situation, it seems like, where we don't have water shortages like you may experience on the West Coast. But this is an issue for foundations. And we are built on black clay here, mostly in Texas, which is not great because as soon as there's a lack of rain, then it dries up and it cracks up uh, kind of like the desert. You see uh, anytime there's a drought in the desert and you get those big gaping cracks, they look like a bunch of little hexagons almost throughout the ground. That happens here. But one thing you need to keep in mind, especially when you're buying a home, is that if you have a new construction property, you have a 10 year foundation warranty that is standard in Texas. And if you buy an existing home and it's made it past 10 years, then most likely the foundation has settled and it's not something that you really have to worry about because most of the setting has been put into place. And we also have what we call foundation hoses, especially all new construction properties now. Part of the irrigation is they will line soaker hoses around the foundation and that becomes part of your sprinkler system. So if you're running your sprinkler system two or three times a week, part of that is your foundation hose, which has a nice little drip for however long you set that for 10 or 15 minutes, two or three times a week. And that will keep the foundation moist so that during the drought times, it doesn't get completely dried up. And whenever it dries up and shifts away from the foundation, that's when you can start to have shifting and that can cause cracks and damages and things you don't want to deal with at your house. 
So number 12 is going to be the cost of living. Now, Texas has a lower cost of living compared to the national average, but whenever it comes to cities like Dallas, it's slightly higher than the national average. So if you're moving from the rural areas into the city, of course, you're gonna experience higher pricing on pretty much everything. However, if you're coming from the West Coast or the East Coast, this is probably going to be a bargain everything you find here in Texas, no matter where you move to. But when it comes to housing prices, rental rates and property taxes, those are all on the rise, making it a little bit more challenging for individuals individuals and families to find affordable housing. However, there is good news. Texas just passed for the first time in a long time, I, I don't know if ever, property tax relief. And we will get into that in another video, but I'm telling you that is a huge deal because property taxes have been one of the determining factors of why a lot of people don't want to move here, especially coming from California, West Coast areas where they tend to have fixed property taxes or property taxes are a little bit more in line, even though home prices seem to be more out of control there in our opinion or at least what we're looking at especially on the data but whenever they come here they're like oh i can get a home half the price but my property taxes may be twice as much and they could go up the next year so you have to do certain things like put homestead exemptions in place or senior exemptions or military exemptions in place all to protect yourself but now recently dallas has just passed legislation finally for significant property tax relief it will make a difference i don't think it's as good as it could have been but i will take something over nothing and you can dispute your taxes every single year. Regardless, we actually have a link in the description below for a company that will help you dispute your taxes if you're already here in Texas and that's something you need some help with. It's definitely worth the fee to pay somebody else to go and do that for you. Otherwise, it's going to be a pain in the you know what to go do all of that on your own. I'd rather just pay somebody and get it over with, let them handle it, but check the description below for that link through in center and they'll be happy to help you out. And that brings us to number 11, which is the home prices. And the home prices are on the rise here in Texas, especially in the Dallas area, because this is a hot spot of where people want to move to. It's creating a significant amount of demand and the commercial development is at an all time high here in Dallas. It's number one for 2023 for most commercial development in the United States. On top of that, there's so many companies, corporations and businesses flocking here because they are sick and tired of all the policies and regulations, kind of like we talked about on the first one. And so they're moving out of these high regulated high tax areas to come to Texas, which is a lot friendlier environment when it comes to business and taxes in general. And so that is bringing a lot of development. And when that happens, that is creating more housing demand. And we still are short housing in the Dallas market, according to the statistics, regardless of what you may see out there on the internet and on YouTube, everybody's saying that the crash is happening. But you know what's funny is I've been reviewing a lot of these videos from 2022 and 2021. They say the housing crash is going to happen each and every, you know, the next year, but it's interesting to watch the 2021 videos say that housing crash is going to happen in 2022 and those 2022 videos saying the housing crash is going to happen in 2023. And you know what? It may happen, but at least in Dallas, I will show you here on this chart. Look at what is happening. And this is since 2003. Over the last 20 years, you've just seen a steady increase. But what I want to point out is that, look, you have your peaks during the summer. You have your seasonality. It starts to decline over the last half of the year. And then it peaks during the summer. It declines a little bit. It peaks during the summer, it declines a little bit, it peaks during the summer, declines a little bit, peaks during the summer, or declines a little bit, peak, decline, peak, decline, peak, summer, decline, peak, summer, a little bit, but the last couple of years, it's continually gone up. Now, maybe the last six months would have been the best time to buy or from August of 2022 to December of 2022. That's where we saw the biggest seasonal decrease really ever here in Dallas. But the thing is, is that everybody backed off because interest rates were around 7%. So it's the catch 22, but look at now, prices are going back up again and are becoming higher than they were last year. But what you will notice is every single time house prices go up, they come down a little bit and they go up, whenever they go back up, they go back higher than they were before. And we've never seen a significant crash here in the Dallas market. It's always been this steady eddy pace. Now, the last couple of years have been an anomaly, but that's also because so many people were trying to get out of these high restricted areas, high tax rates, being forced to get shots and all kinds of stuff that they didn't want to do. And so that definitely bumped everything up here. But now we're seeing, even with everything starting to normalize, prices are still stabilizing higher than they were 
were before. And so with the commercial development and the corporations that are moving here and people in general that are now working remotely and working from home, they want to live in a more freedom friendly, business friendly environment. And that's why at least Dallas and Texas overall is going to likely continue to grow at a steady rate. And they're projecting that Dallas will overtake Chicago within the next five years in population. And by 2100, and I know that seems like a far off, but by 2100, Dallas will likely be the number one metro in the country. Think about that, overtaking Los Angeles and New York. And what that means is that prices are probably going to continually steadily increase over time. And yes, we will see our seasonality of the dips. But you know, again, if interest rates are where they're at and they come back down, we know the demand is there. We work with clients every single day and we know we have ones that make moves and the ones that bought last year don't regret that because their homes are worth more. Did they see a little bit of dip in Q3 and Q4 of last year? Yes, but they've already recouped that and they weren't planning to move in one year anyways. Most people, when they buy a home, plan to stay there for three to seven years and the average right now is staying there for 13 years. If you stay in a home for 13 years, you're going to weather any type of crash. So it doesn't matter. Actually, it does matter when you buy because that's going to determine how much appreciation you have. But you don't lose money unless you sell the house in the middle of a crash. And the last time I checked, most people don't sell homes in the middle of a crash unless they get into some serious financial trouble or circumstances that force them to do that. And if that's the case, you could never predict that likely. I mean, it's very difficult to predict death, divorce, taxes, those types of things that could cause you or force you to sell. So if that's a timing thing, it's just a timing thing. But most people, when they buy, plan to stay in that home three to seven years and the average right now is 13. So that's going to weather any type of market crash. So even if you buy now and the market does crash out next year, as long as you don't sell, you didn't lose that money and you'll probably bounce right back within another year or two, at least here in the Dallas market. Now we're getting into the top 10 and that is traffic. And I tell you what, traffic does suck here in Dallas. I wanna jump in the map and show you a couple of things. So if you look here, you've got downtown Dallas, you've got loop 12, which kind of circles all of Dallas. This is one of the, the main loops. And then you've got 635, which is also known as LBJ Freeway. That circles uh, Dallas and turns into I-20 down here. Then you've got uh, George W. Bush Turnpike, which that is uh, kind of like a half circle right around here but that is is pretty uh well moving throughout there you've got uh you've got the dallas north tollway right here uh, which goes all the way through that's pretty good and then you've got the sam rayburn tollway right through here and then you've got i-75 well i tell you what i-75 pretty much sucks anytime during traffic in the morning in the afternoon it doesn't matter it's not that much fun 635 also especially through garland uh mesquite richardson this whole area you know coming in from forney right here highway 80 or highway 20 coming in from forney absolutely sucks those are probably some of the worst areas that you're going to get caught up into uh, trying to get to the airport, this whole uh, section over here, you get caught up. I mean, going into downtown Dallas, if you're commuting, you're going to hit traffic during rush hour at any times. It is estimated here in Dallas that you will sit in traffic if you're commuting an average 40 hours per year. That's like a whole work week taken from your life sitting in traffic. But that stat is determined, typically losing the most amount of time between 3 to 5 p.m. So if you can avoid commuting between the hours of 3 to 5 p.m., that's going to put you in a much better situation. And if you're willing to pay the tolls, which I'm going to get to that here in a second, then that is usually a less trafficked area because people avoid paying those tolls. And so that could get you home a little bit faster. All right. Number nine is going to be a lack of natural scenery. And what I mean by that overall in Texas is that, well, it's mostly flat, especially in the Dallas area. It's flat. Now you get down to Austin, San Antonio, you get into the hill country, which is a lot nicer to look at, especially when you're driving around. But that does cause for a lot more traffic and issues because they can't build everywhere because of the hill. Hills. Same thing with Houston. You have the Gulf. Are you driving around Houston and looking at the Gulf, uh, this beautiful body of water? <laughs> no, uh, the Gulf is dirty. We're on the wrong side of the current. Let me just show you in the map real quick. So on the map here, you'll see this is pretty much the wrong side of the current uh, of the Gulf. And so this makes all this area dirty water, basically all the way up to right here about uh, right there. So the stream just seems to carry, the Gulf Stream just seems to carry the muddy water all through this area and circulate it. Now, when you, let me even zoom out a little bit here because of course you've got Mexico, right? Beautiful beaches in Mexico. But whenever you hit Gulf Shores, then all the way over 
Here, from Gulf Shores all the way to Florida, of course, this is some of the most beautiful beaches in the world right here, especially Pensacola, Destin, you know, this whole area, the Gulf side. I love the Gulf side. And then, of course, you hit uh, Cancun and all through the Caribbean all the way down this way. You know, you see the beautiful beaches in Havana and uh, the Cayman Islands, all that. So this is all pretty, you know, this is all pretty water over here. And then this side, well, we get uh, we got the crappy side of it. And so, uh, you know, as far as lack of natural scenery, we don't have mountains like huge mountains. I love whenever I travel to Colorado, uh, to California, Oregon, Washington State. Uh, you know, there's something about mountains. I love to be driving and, and looking off in the distance and seeing those mountains. Absolutely beautiful. I love driving down the west coast of the Pacific Coast Highway, right? That's what it is. PCH, I believe, Pacific Coast Highway. Let me know in the comments, by the way, if that's correct. And, you know, I love being able to drive along that road and you see the ocean out there. You can do that in Florida as well. Along the east coast, you've got these uh, towns, South Carolina, Savannah, I think Savannah, right? Charleston, you know, you think about those everywhere along the east coast beautiful and then you come to dallas and it's like city you go to houston city you go to san antonio city now driving on the outskirts of san antonio of austin again you're gonna see some of that hill country and you do get to drive over some of the lakes but in dallas nope not gonna happen all flat but the dallas skyline is amazing it's absolutely beautiful so if you are a city type person and you love the buildings i do believe they're building beautiful buildings here and the dallas skyline i think is one of the prettiest especially in the morning whenever that sun's reflecting off of it in certain ways for the sunrise. I've just driven that many times going to the airport, driving through the city. It's beautiful, but I would love to see a lot more water and a lot more mountains, but it's just not going to happen. All right, number eight is going to be the toll roads. They are out of control here, especially in the Dallas area, Houston, Austin. I just don't get it. I mean, we already pay taxes. You understand that part of the price of gas goes towards roads. And then you pay state and federal taxes as well that go towards the roads. So why is it that they build a new road and then we got to pay a toll on top of it that it absolutely <laughs> aggravates me? Let me show you on the map what's happening here in Dallas. So you've got the Dallas North Tollway. This was the main toll road for quite some time and ends right here whenever you get to Prosper. It's, it's being extended now up through Salina right now, and it'll probably go to Oklahoma eventually. This used to be the main toll road and the only toll road throughout all of Dallas, but now that's changed. Now you have uh, George W. Bush Turnpike. This was a whole, you know, built out, which is great. It relieved a lot of stress and tension on traffic, but it's a toll road. Now you have the Sam Rayburn Tollway 121 that cuts right through Frisco, Plano, the colony, and goes right through the north entrance of the airport. That's a toll road. Uh, you know what they're they're going to extend that toll road up here. And, and so those are the most convenient roads to get through all of Dallas as well, because 75, if you look at 75 right here, not a toll road, that's the one that gets completely backed up with traffic. So it's two things. Are they just collecting money that they shouldn't be collecting on? Uh, regardless, I think it's completely bogus that we should have to pay tolls on these roads that we already pay for for taxes. In my opinion, that's double taxation. And that's something we don't like here in Texas. So what's up with the legislation? What's going on with that? Why do we continue to allow this? Well, if you look into this website, Texans for Toll Free Highways, they go into pretty uh, good depth here talking about how George W. Bush and Rick Perry really turned this into a monopoly for a public-private partnership. And so what they're saying is that Texas is typically about $31 billion in debt because of their roadways. And so this is the way for them to recoup that money, but also it goes back to you know corporations that they favored and gave those contracts to on top of that. Most most of them are foreign, which doesn't make any sense. Shouldn't we be keeping jobs in Texas and in America as a whole? But you can go through here. It's pretty interesting to read through some of the things that they have to state on that. And if you want to petition to get rid of these tolls, which I highly recommend, and I'm going to jump on that bandwagon as well, then we should definitely get rid of tolls. But otherwise, I will say I travel mostly on the toll roads uh, because it's just convenient. But I probably spend about 50 to $80 a month just on tolls. But I spend less time in traffic, and I do believe my time is a 
a lot more valuable than the couple of dollars a day that I might spend on the toll road. So it really depends on you and your situation, what you're willing to do. If you're working on that west side of Plano, Frisco, all throughout here, you know, you're likely going to need to take the toll road no matter where you go, especially if you're going to be commuting into downtown Dallas. It is the less congested route to get there. And if you're living on east side of Plano, uh, east side of Frisco, I mean, you can hit up 75, but you want to avoid those times that you're going to be heading down to the city if you're commuting and therefore try to avoid that at all costs. Number seven is going to be construction. I don't know about you and your state or where you're located at, but Texas seems to be completely under construction all the time. I swear, I-35 going all the way from Dallas to Austin has been under construction for at least 20 years. They've really just completed about a good portion of that, but there's still sections of it still being worked on today. And I remember in high school, which was 1998, by the way, making some of those weekend road trips down to Austin and I-35 all the way down, completely torn up. It's still mostly torn up today. They just finally finished a major section going through Waco, which was a big help. Sections going into Austin, which is a big help. But now the sections between Waco and Dallas, they're still working on and building out. And you're going to run into construction everywhere throughout Dallas. All the roads, it seems like every time they finish one road, they start working on another one and expanding and expanding and expanding so there can be more growth in the area, which this is great for the economy. And this is why so many people are moving here. And because of the corporations and the jobs being created and the housing demand, all of that, they have to continue expand. And so therefore, you're just going to continually deal with construction pretty much nonstop. It's going to be a major problem as you commute because that will slow things down. Now, I will say one of the good things here in the Dallas area, at least, is that they do a lot of major, major road construction at night. They will have crews out there from like 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. with super bright lights, you know, doing major construction. So that does help out quite a bit. What impresses me the most is when they build roads and bridges over existing highways and don't don't stop the traffic. They built an entire park, the downtown park, Clyde Warren Park, over a highway and kept that highway open the whole time. It's like, how do you even do that? It's an engineering feat. It's absolutely amazing. But that's the innovation and the expansion that's happening here in Dallas. Plus, it's going to just keep growing more and more uh, out and out <laughs> all this area. That's why they're projecting Dallas to be the number one metro by 2100. And trust me, for you 20 year olds, that's gonna come before you know it. You'll remember, I watched that video whenever I was 21 years old and now I'm 100 and Dallas is now, you know, the largest metro in the United States. You'll remember this video. You heard it here first. All right, number six, I can almost get down to one hand here, but number six is going to be the urban sprawl, meaning Dallas-Fort Worth is massive, okay? It's going to take you an hour to get almost anywhere. And if we jump into the map real quick, I'll show you again what I mean by that. And look at <laughs> look at Dallas right here, over 7.3 million people in the metro area right now. But I will tell you, if you are commuting from Frisco, uh, that is going to be 50 minutes, okay? I promise you, 50 minutes right there. If you're coming from Prosper, uh, that's going to be one hour, okay? Uh, at least. If you're uh, coming from Forney because traffic is so terrible, that's probably going to be 45 minutes. Uh, even though it's only 20 minutes outside of Dallas, okay? Uh, if you're coming from South Dallas, same thing. You're going to hit probably 40 minutes of traffic. If you're trying to go to Fort Worth, guess what? It's going to take you an hour to get there, 60 minutes. Uh, if you're trying to go to the game, uh, the Dallas Cowboys or the Texas Rangers, and you live up in Frisco, you're going to have to come through all these roadways to get down there. It's a little bit of a trek, okay, to get over there. And so just getting around, uh, if you want to go to... Uh, you know, if you want to go to Lake Ray Hubbard, Lake Levon, I mean, people in Frisco and Prosper uh, typically go to Louisville Lake. You stay right there. Uh, Grapevine Lake will be a little bit of a trek to get to. But if you want to try to get to South Lake, um, South Lake over here, that's going to be a little bit of a trek. But overall, it's going to take some time to get to places. Living in Prosper, you're going to, you know, seem like you're a little bit out there. You can get your groceries and get something to eat. Easy to do. But if you really want to get into some of the hot spots, you're looking at 20, 25, maybe 30 minutes to get anywhere to Frisco, Plano, at least uh, for some of the more popular areas. 
Number five is going to be the crime rate. And since I can't really talk about that legally as a licensed real estate, let me just show you what it says on a couple of websites. All right, so if you look on this website called Neighborhood Scout, a lot of people go in here and they'll look at, uh, you know, you can click on crime, economics, demographics, real estate, overview, schools, things like that. Kind of take a look on here. You're gonna see most dangerous uh, for the highly purple area. And you'll just see what they show on here. But this is, this really surprised me <laughs> for, 100 is the safest, uh, safer than 4% of US neighborhoods, Dallas. That's that's kind of a problem, right? I mean, you, you've got a 96% chance it's unsafer than everywhere else in America. So now you look at that um, and it is well above uh, Texas and the national median is four and it's well above Texas as well. So Dallas is uh, not ranking that high, but you can see it's pretty heavily concentrated in certain areas. Uh, you'll look over here um, in the northeast and uh, a little bit more of North Dallas, these areas, it looks like a lot less. So it really does depend on the area, what you're looking at. But what I highly recommend is that you check some online maps like this, check the police department as well, if this is a big concern to you. Now, if we go up here and we go to, let's say we get a lot of people asking about Frisco. So if we go to Frisco, Texas, now I found this interesting as well. And we click on the crime rate and look down here and go, uh, let's see, we'll go down here and it says 47. You know, as far as I could tell, I've seen several articles naming Frisco, one of the safest areas in the country. So it's saying it's safer than 47% of US neighborhoods and you can just take a look at there, but it's well below uh, the average for Texas and for the national median. Uh, let's take a look at Austin real quick, since everybody seems to really, really love Austin. Well, it's a five, <laughs> so it's not much better. Uh, Austin is a five. Let's look at a Houston as well and see what uh, Houston has to say on crime. It's a two, even worse. Wow, amazing. And then let's, let's look at San Antonio and it's a three. All right, so there you go. So it looks like Dallas is the, <laughs> the safest out of all those major areas. But again, even people that are moving here, we don't typically get a lot of people that wanna move into Metro Dallas. Although I lived in Metro Dallas for most of my life here and I absolutely loved it, never had any issues. I even lived in a historic district really close to downtown. And you know what, knew all the neighbors, never had any issues. I never had Amazon packages stole off my porch, which uh, I think that's a good indicator of you know if you want to be in that area or not but that's probably the worst of it is getting your amazon packages stolen uh there wasn't any break-ins or happening things like that but otherwise you know look on the crime maps look on neighborhood scout look on niche.com look on the local police departments for those areas you got to make these determinations for yourself but otherwise i think a lot of the neighborhoods we get into here in the texas area are pretty good neighbors looking out for each other and when i get to number one you're going to understand also why a lot of people feel safe all right, and number four is going to be, if you are a road tripper, guess what? It is going to take you forever to get outside of Texas because it is so massive and driving is gonna be a little bit of an issue. If you're that person that likes to just hit the road, let me show you on the map. So again, you know, we're here in Dallas and uh, we're at the tip of what's called the triangle, which you have Dallas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio. You can see Austin right there, of course, San Antonio, you have Houston and then Dallas. Now. If you live in Dallas like we do, you know, getting down to Austin is going to be about 3.5 hours uh, for a little road trip, which is is not bad. OK, uh, San Antonio, it's going to be about four, uh, four to four and a half hours to get there, really. And you've got to cut through Austin. Now you can kind of go around on some toll roads and avoid a little bit of that, but about four and a half. Um, Houston's gonna be around four, four and a half, depending on where you're going in there. So that's a pretty good half day trip just to get anywhere that you wanna go from there. But if you wanna get anywhere outside of that, well, guess what? Um, what's the closest spot? Uh, Oklahoma City, if you wanna drive north, who wants to visit Oklahoma City? Not a lot of people. You drive west, I mean, this is like an eight hour drive from Dallas just to get out of Texas over to El Paso. Now, if you wanna to go to Tucson, that may be the closest spot, or you, you know, if you wanna hit somewhere, I mean, Carlsbad is a pretty cool area. Uh, you got Albuquerque as well, but you know, you're gonna, again, you're gonna have quite a bit of driving to go up there. Uh, if you wanna get up to Lubbock, I mean, there's just, there's not much. And then what are your options over here? Shreveport, I mean, you can get to New Orleans now. New Orleans is about five hours from Houston. So that's a pretty good little half day road trip to get to New Orleans. I, I would say that's definitely worth it. 
going from Houston to Gulf Shores to hit pretty water. You've got about an eight, you know, maybe to 10 hour trip uh, wherever you're getting. So that's a decent day trip on the road if you wanna check that out. And Dallas, I mean, we're like, okay, we're gonna get to Shreveport. I mean, Jackson, Jackson, Mississippi could be kind of cool, but it's gonna be eight hours for us to get over to New Orleans from Dallas if we try to do that which I would say is probably one of the, the cooler areas to get to within a drive other, you know, if we if we uh, mark out Austin, San Antonio and Houston, but I love New Orleans. It's a pretty good area. Uh, I probably wouldn't drive to Gulf Shores or Pensacola. I'd probably just go ahead and fly over there and then I probably wouldn't even fly over there. I would fly over to Tampa, Fort Myers, Naples, something like that if I wanted to go. Or the good thing is, is I can fly down to Cancun, Mexico, Playa del Carmen, Belize. I absolutely love Belize. Uh, that's a two to two and a half hour flight, two hour flight to Cancun, two and a half hours to Belize. Uh, I love those areas. That's what I love about being in Dallas is being so close to the Caribbean. I'm kind of like a Caribbean guy. Uh, I love hanging out there. Would much rather fly to the Caribbean than flying so far to Hawaii. I've been to Hawaii three times. It's not all it's cracked up to be, all right? So let me know, are you a big Hawaii fan or, or not so much? I just don't think it's worth the trip. And plus it's so expensive there. The Caribbean is so much cheaper and I, I feel like a lot more authentic, you know, much better food as well. But you can see here, you look at, I mean, you've got Denver. Denver's a pretty, I think that's a 10 hour, that's probably a 10 hour drive from Dallas. So, you know, as far as driving and road trips, I mean, it's gonna take a lot. Now, the cool thing about being in Dallas is that your center of the country, if you're gonna be flying, and that's what I do love. We do travel quite a bit, attend a lot of conferences, and events around the country. A lot of them are in Vegas, a lot of them are in Florida. And so that's a very easy two hour trip across one time zone. We're central, so we don't get extremely jet lagged. We usually get somewhere within two to three hours. You can get to Chicago in a couple of hours, New York in like three hours. I mean, very reasonable trips overall. California within three hours. I mean, I love it. That's the best thing about being in Dallas is being able to fly pretty much anywhere in the country within a two to three hour range. All right, number three is the bugs, the mosquitoes, the snakes, uh, creepy crawlers, spiders, all of that stuff. If you are not a fan of that, especially those people coming from West Coast, again, I'm so spoiled because everything's so perfect on the West Coast, right? Look, I love the West Coast. I love Orange County. My parents are actually from Orange County. My whole family is from Orange County, California, and I have no idea why they moved to Texas. Made no sense to me. Actually, my two older brothers were born in Orange County. I had a grandma that lived in Santa Ana. My other grandma lived in Costa Mesa. My parents, you know, kind of hung around Huntington Beach. And we used to travel during the summers. We would take those road trips, kind of like the Griswolds across country. We would drive. We would never fly. We never stayed in hotels. We stayed at campgrounds along the way. So we would camp out. We had one of those crappy tents that took all three of the boys to put up. My parents got to sleep in the van. It had a fold down back seat into a nice little bed and we got to sleep on the ground. But really, I look back and it's like, those were really cool times. Times. We seem to hate them as kids, but every summer we take the two or three week vacation and drive. We would drive to California, drive to Colorado, drive to Florida, but most of the time drive back to California to see our aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas. And, you know, I just remember leaving Texas. It was a hundred degree heat back then as well. It hadn't rained in a couple of months. Everything was completely dead. And then we'd pull up in Newport or Costa Mesa and like it's 70 degrees everything's green, beautiful flowers. And I always just thought, Man, this place is paradise, right? Always wanted to live there and just never made it back over there. But I do love Newport Beach, one of my favorite areas in the world, if not my favorite, I don't know. Just love Newport Beach, such a cool vibe. And you know, that was it. And then we'd come back to Texas and it'd be hot and dry and dead and bugs everywhere. And that's the case right now too. Unless you got a good sprinkler system, your grass is going to be dead <laughs> if you don't water on a regular basis. Right now in some of my videos recently, you've probably heard cicadas, locust, they could be called as well. Cicadas, they're just everywhere. I like it. I think it's kind of a cool sound, but they're all over the place. Then you got spiders and snakes and creepy crawlers and all kinds of stuff that come out of the woodwork. They love the hot weather. Mosquitoes are probably the absolute worst. Nobody likes them. And flies, flies. I can't stand the flies because we love to do things outside and there's just a lot of flies you know it seems like over in california and oregon you know these areas they just don't have bugs or i don't know maybe just the weather's so perfect you don't notice it but over here if you go out at night especially at dusk right as the sun is setting you are going to get eaten up by mosquitoes flies during the day if you try to eat outside and you're not within a screened porch or a covered patio or something that blocks it out there's going to be flies all over the place you need to buy these little screens and nets 
nets and covers for all your food. So if you try to have a picnic or hang out at the pool, you got to get these little mini tents, little mini tents and all these types of things to go over everything so that you can just keep the flies off of stuff because they're everywhere. And some of the flies are biting flies. They're not going to give you anything, but they just hurt. I don't know the difference between the two, but half the flies harmless, just annoying. And the other half will bite you. <laughs> and so it's just, you just feel like a little sting and you're like, oh, and there's a big fly on you. And if you open the door, for some reason, five of them are going to fly inside the house and they're going to be stuck inside your house for the next week. And you won't be able to get them out. And no matter how much you try, they're always going to be around somewhere flying around in the house. So you got to get a little mini bug zapper or a little sticky tray with a light on it. You know, something that you can plug in to try to attract them and get them to leave you alone and go towards that. Now, the other thing is snakes are a big deal here and you will see them, especially up here in Prosper, along with coyotes. Now, there are still, I've seen coyotes down in Dallas. I don't know where they're coming from, but they are around. So you want to be mindful of that. I've been at my house inside of Dallas, in Dallas Metro, hanging out on the front porch and we literally saw a coyote just running down the street and I was like, Oh, there's a coyote. We see them all the time over here in Prosper running around. There's still a lot of open fields going on here in Prosper. And there's a lot of bunny rabbits. So I'm sure they're eating a lot of bunnies around here. And it's just uh, something to be mindful of. They're mostly scared of humans. So I wouldn't be worried about it. They're not running around in packs. It's not a pack of wolves. So don't be concerned about that. But the other thing is also cockroaches. If you don't like cockroaches, well, guess what? In Texas, we have Texas sized cockroaches. Now, if you see a big giant, one and they can be like this big running across your floor, that's not a big deal. It's going to happen anytime during the summer. They're going to be driven inside. They're going to be trying to find some little bit of AC. They'll come out. You might see one or two. That's not a problem. What you want to keep an eye out for is the baby cockroaches, the little ones, col little colonies or nest or whatever the case may be. That is a problem. That's an issue. If you see that anywhere in your house, you definitely want to get pest control involved get that taken care of as soon as possible. Another thing is termites. We do have termites termites really badly here in Texas. So that's something that you have to get your home treated for. Otherwise, they will eat your house up. And wasps, you know, wasps, they just love to nest up around your house. You'll see them. Now there's this viral videos going around where somebody will pour in some gasoline in a cup and just hold it up to the wasp nest. That will kill them. We used to get aerosol cans and we would spray them and then light them with the lighter when we were kids and we would torch wasps that way. Don't recommend that at all, by the way. Do not try that at home. Make sure you call local pest control. I have a service that comes out quarterly and they come out and they check everything. More natural versus chemical, that, but they spray for bugs, cockroaches approaches to keep them out of the house. They wipe all your windows and doors, check for nests, you know, so they'll take care of that sort of thing. But if you want to try to self-eradicate, have fun and good luck on that one. All right. Number two, <laughs> number two, is going to be allergies. This is a major problem here in Texas now. I'm fortunate that I've never had allergies. That's probably going to upset some of you that have to deal with allergies. And I also know of people that come from the West Coast that have never had allergies in their life and then they move to Texas and it's just horrendous. I have several friends that will go through allergy season and literally for three, sometimes four or five months, they will just be puffy, sniffling. It's like a never ending cold. I don't wish it a upon anybody at all whatsoever. Just because I've seen several friends go through the misery of having allergies or having to be on allergy medication or these all these types of things. Sometimes we say it snows pollen here in Texas. You will see uh, whenever the pollen sets, you'll walk outside sometimes and you'll have a yellow coat on everything, cars, the ground, your house, windows. That's how much pollen is present here in the Texas area. It kills people. I mean, literally, well, actually not literally, don't let me say that, but it just really ruins quality of life. So that is something you better keep an eye out for. You better be mindful of, and maybe it's worth a visit here in the springtime, but otherwise, I don't know, maybe some of the pros of living in Texas can kind of overcome that. But I have had many people that we know that move here, develop allergies, or they're just not used to it. And it's just becomes not so fun for them. Now, here's one thing you can do. I've heard this, and maybe because I grew up on Texas honey, but if you get some Texas honey, and of course I'm not 
a medical doctor and I don't treat any type of condition. Just what I've heard through the grapevine is that if you consume local, pure, unfiltered honey from Texas, from the area that has natural uh, antihistamines, is that how you say that? Antihistamines in it, I guess, are things that kind of help you develop immunity towards those allergies. So maybe you just need a big scoop of honey and that may help out. I'm not sure, but you could, it's worth a try, right? Plus it tastes good. Or you could put some in your tea or coffee or something like that, your smoothie. I put a little bit in my smoothie pretty much every day. So maybe that's what's helped me out because I grew up on Texas honey or, you know, within this environment. I do have family members that have grown up here though and they have allergies and maybe I should check if they're consuming honey or not. Uh, maybe that could be the reason. I've never had a problem, never had an allergy. I'm thankful for that. <laughs> so, you know, just be mindful when you're making that move here. Drum roll, please, for the number one reason you shouldn't move to Texas. And that's gonna be open carry laws. That's right. We're kind of like the wild, wild west here. You can open carry weapons around on your belt. You can conceal carry. I mean, that's why I said earlier that, you know, uh, there's typically in the areas where the neighbors know each other, it's a good community. You don't have to worry about much crime because a lot of people are armed here in Texas, even in the city areas, especially Dallas, Houston. I mean, going back to those traditional conservative values and thought process, you have a right to protect your home here. And if that's something that makes you uncomfortable, well, people will have guns on them and can have them on their belt inside of stores. Now, of course, there can be limitations like a post office or a government building. And there are schools in Texas, by the way, that allow teachers to carry. And the interesting thing is those schools don't have any problems. But the thing is, is that, yes, there are some very restricted areas. You're not supposed to have a gun regardless. But again, people will open carry. You could be in Walmart or another store or something like that and see somebody with a gun on their hip and they're not a police officer. It's it's just going to happen. I remember growing up in high school, half the high school kids used to have shotguns hanging in the back window of their truck and they didn't lock the doors. I mean, that's the type of town and area I grew up in high school where we would go out frequently out to the country shooting guns. I mean, I still do it to this day, just not as much because ammo has become quite a commodity. It's become quite expensive and scarce as well. So I'd rather just kind of hold on to my ammo. But you know, the thing is, is that you can carry in your car. So if people don't have it on, them. A lot of people have it in your car. There is, uh, I believe it's called something like the castle law or something, but you know, they consider your home as your castle. You're allowed to defend that, but also your car can be considered your castle as well. And you can defend that with the right things in place. Now you can't just pull out your gun and, you know, show that all over the place. And as you're taught, at least I'm taught in the military, I was trained in the military. I also have concealed carry license as well. You do not point your weapon at anything that you do not intend to shoot, period. You don't do that as a warning because you have it on you, either you pull it and use it or you don't. Otherwise, if you don't, then the situation can be de-escalated in a certain way. That's always the best way. It is a last resort is what you want to use that for. But uh, again, people in Texas love hunting. They love shooting. They love, uh, you know, they love their guns. I've got several of them myself. So, you know, it's something that I'm comfortable with a hundred percent because we grew up with it around as kids. And then of course, going into the military made me very comfortable with it. And it was my main mode of protection in those types of scenarios. And so that is something that if you are extremely anti-gun, you don't like to see that type of thing, you feel unsafe, even though I would much rather be around a group of people in a city, a town, an area that are well-trained, well-respected, law-abiding citizens that have guns versus not knowing who has them or just random people having them. I'm always comfortable. If I see somebody that has a gun sitting on their belt or displayed openly, I'm not worried about them. They don't scare me. I'm pretty sure that they're well-trained, well-versed. They know the law. They're respecting the law. And I've been pulled over. I've been pulled over a couple of times with my gun in my car. And there's a way that you let the cop know that. So I've never had any issues. And it's something like whenever they pull you over, you put both hands on the steering wheel and you let them know as soon as they walk up. You're also supposed to hand them your license and your concealed carry license at the same time. But I will just have both my hands on the wheel. As soon as they walk up, I'll say, hey, I just want to let you know I've got a gun in the car and he or she is going to say, where is it at? And I'll let them know if it's in my door jam, which is right there. They know that's within my reach, but I'm letting them know that. So they feel a lot more comfortable. And every time I've been pulled over, the cop will say, where is it at? And I tell them it's in my door jam I'll be like, okay, do you mind grabbing your license? And I'm sure I'll say, sure. It's in my right pocket. And he'll say, okay, go ahead and get it. And then I'll get that. But normally what I'll do is I'll go ahead and pull that out as they're approaching the car. I'll just go ahead and
and pull it out. I'll pull out my license, have it, hold my hands on the steering wheel, let them know, hey, I've got a gun in the car. And they say, okay, cool, give them that. They'll go back. Now I've also got veteran license plates. So I've actually never received a ticket. I've been pulled over several times, but I've never gotten a ticket. And the funny thing is, is the last time I got pulled over, the cop pulled over two of us. Now we were driving on the highway. It was me and somebody was behind me. I didn't know who it was, but there was a cop like standing on the highway and he just pointed at me and he was like, pull over. He pointed, you know, like directly at me and he got both of us. Now he pulled up in between both of us. So the guy behind me was behind his cruiser and I was in front. So he walks up to my vehicle and I let him know I had my license. And I said, by the way, I've got a gun in the car. And he goes, okay, where's it at? I told him. And he goes, okay. He goes, you mind just stepping out of the vehicle? And sometimes they'll do that too, just so they can keep an eye on you. And I said, sure. So I go back and I step behind the vehicle and uh, he goes and he runs my license and the other guy's parked. Well, he comes out and comes back to me and he goes, Hey, thank you for your service. You know, cause he can see my license plate. And I said, appreciate it. And he goes, just uh, slow down a little bit. And I'm going to go give this other guy the ticket. <laughs> I was like, my man, my man. You know, the thing is, is that usually if you have a gun in the car, the cops will respect you more and let you out. Typically, I can't guarantee or promise that. I'm just saying that they have a respect for people that are well-trained, are licensed, even though you don't have to be to have a gun in your car. You don't have to have a license on you or a concealed carry license. But, you know, those are the types of scenarios that are here in the Texas area. So all of this is wrapped up to say that if any of those make you uncomfortable and you don't like that at all, then maybe. Texas is not the right spot for you. Although Austin could be because uh, Austin is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more like California, those areas where the city of Austin, they're kind of like the mini California, right? We call that the California of Texas, by the way. So if you do like all that stuff and you want to maintain that stuff, but you just want better taxes, a uh, better business friendly environment, less expensive homes, then yes, move to Austin. If you want to keep the same policies of which are driving Austin crazy and have those same situations, yes, definitely move there. Other Otherwise, come to Dallas. We'd be happy to have you. And if you're thinking about making that move, again, my name is Levi Lassig, my business partner, Travis. We get calls, text, emails every single day. And, you know, it has been an absolute pleasure for us to help people make their move and get settled in here. Even the people that are locally that make their move around the Dallas area, it's just been a blast to help them. And if you have any questions at all about your current situation, this is all we emphasize to you is reach out in the description below. All of our information is down there. Give us a call, shoot us a text or send us an email or schedule a Zoom call, our personal favorite, so we can talk to you about your situation and find out if this is the right time for you and your family to make a move. We're not here to sell you a house. We're here to help you improve your life and your situation. And whatever the case may be, maybe it's not the right time for you right now, but we still want to have that discussion with you, see what may be the best fit for you and your family. That way we can plan accordingly, work on building your future, and hopefully that will be here in the great state of Texas, especially Dallas. And until next time, well, we hope to show you around town. What if I told you that you could get on the ground floor of multi-billion dollar development here in the heart of Frisco, have everything at your fingertips, what they are calling the 15-minute city?